eclectic congregation and so grateful for the invitation and I'm so grateful for your investment specifically uh, in the nations of the earth and your specialty in the Asian nations and what a calling God has given you as a congregation and to see your faithfulness is so encouraging to all of us around the fellowship and we appreciate all of you. First Kings chapter 19, in the word of the Lord, I was joking with Pastor Tori. I said, I'm going to preach from a text that Pastor Campbell's never preached from before, First Kings 19. That's a joke because <laughs> when uh, little kids are in love or they think they're in love, you might find them back in the day holding a flower and tearing off a pet petal saying, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, until the very last petal and they're hoping it lands on, he loves me, so they could declare, he loves me. I've seen a number of people play an interesting game with the calling of God. I'm called to preach, I'm not called to preach, I'm called to preach, I'm not called to preach, and it can actually become quite a wrestling match for many people over the years. Sometimes you can get stuck, frozen in a specific time or place in our walk with God. Pastor Warner years ago set a number of people free when he made the statement, not everybody is called to preach, but we are all called to minister. Not everybody is called to preach, but we are all called to minister. In other words, if you are a child of God, your starting point is to minister. What that looks like, where that is, you're going to have to work that out between you and God. But all of us are called to minister. And the reality is that you can't even step into the calling to preach until you first stepped into the calling to minister. As followers of Christ, none of us are allowed to simply spectate our way through our walk with God. Second Timothy, the Apostle Paul is explaining the link between salvation and calling to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Do you see how he links the two? He has saved us and called us. They are inseparable. Our salvation and our calling are inseparable. There is something that he has saved us to. He didn't just save us out of something, but he is bringing us into something. He is bringing us into destiny, and that means that ministry is the destiny of every follower of Jesus Christ. And if you aim your life at ministry, you will never fall short of your calling or destiny. So now the question becomes, what is ministry? It's where we can get too official with things sometimes. We like titles, and we like to place labels on things. And too many times we limit the idea of ministry to pulpit expression or some sort of official title. And that's not what it is. But to simplify the idea to its most basic uh, premise, it is serving people. Ministry is serving people. And a life of ministry is a life of service dedicated to the King of Kings. It is responding to the needs presented to us by God through people. How do I minister? How do I serve the need that's been presented before me? And I'm going to read a very familiar passage involving the call of God on Elisha into the ministry. And I want to spend some time examining this text and drawing out some truths about ministry. The message I've entitled, The Mantle of Ministry. Second, or 1 Kings chapter 19. Verse 19, so he departed from there. He found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the 12. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. 
And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. He said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. In order to understand this story, I want to give you some background. Elijah comes onto the scene and immediately becomes public enemy number one. He declares a drought and that it will not rain until he says some, uh, until he says so. The problem is many times when you declare something like that, it affects you as well. And so, but because God told him to, God moves him to a place of provision, uh, to a brook that flows into the Jordan, and there he commanded the ravens to feed him. And every day and every night they brought him bread and meat. Uh, and, uh, th- but after then, uh, after a while, uh, the brook dried up, there's no more water left, and so God moves him again to a widow. And this widow and her son are about to die. They're making their last meal together. Elijah says to her, make me a cake first and God will provide. She obeys. Now listen, I want you to catch this. She ministered to Elijah. A need was presented to her. She barely had enough, but she did have enough. God will never present a need to you if you don't have what is required to meet the need. She didn't think she had enough, but she did. And God does a miracle, and the oil and flour continue to, to last for as long as they are needed. And then God speaks to Elijah after three years. He tells him, go present yourself to Ahab. Tell him that rain is coming. And so Elijah confronts the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, uh, and he executes them. There's this incredible victory, and then all of a sudden there is a defeat. He receives a threat from Jezebel. He runs for his life. The servant of God is now weary and he is worn down. You can hear it in his language. You can see it in his actions. I alone am left. The pressure of ministry, the weight of Israel that he's carrying upon himself has gotten to him. And in chapter 19, there's this incredible revelation of how God helped Elijah. How he brought life back to him. God makes him rest. It's very practical at first. He makes him sleep. He feeds him. Uh, he brings him to a special place. Uh, he allows his, uh, Elijah to uh, experience his presence, a visitation from him. He speaks to him in a cave. Uh, his voice is not uh, in the wind or in the earthquake or in the fire, but he allows him to hear a still, small voice. Uh, he informs him, uh, Elijah, you are not alone. Uh, there are 7,000 others that I've kept for myself. And then he begins to give him instructions. You know, God is always so gracious with us even when we get stuck in our own heads he takes care of his minister personally and then he takes care of the burdens that are bothering his minister he tells him I want you to go and anoint Jehu to take care of the thorn in your flesh that is Jezebel and then he tells him to go and anoint Elisha as prophet in his place now I don't want you to read this wrong Because you could almost look at this and think to yourself, God has had it with Elijah. That he's saying, I'm finished with you. You messed up bad and I'm moving on. Go and anoint Elisha in your place. That's not what's happening here. Because as you see it play out, uh, you are experiencing the grace of God to bring someone alongside Elijah to help carry the load. You know, most scholars believe that Elijah went on for what uh, was another 10 years of fruitful ministry after this moment. And it's as if God is saying, I will give you Jehu to take care of Jezebel, and I will give you Elisha to take care of you. This is when we come to our text, and the Bible says in verse 19, so he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with the twelve yoke of oxen before him. He was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. 
Now you have to picture this scene. Because Elijah knows what is going on. He has received a word from God. It's very clear in the cave. Go and anoint Elisha as a prophet in your place. The problem is Elisha has no idea what is happening. Elisha is just, it's just another ordinary day at the office. He is minding his own business. He is working in the field. He is doing his ordinary job. And the prophet walks by him, throws his mantle on him, and then just keeps on walking. Now, we've made this idea of the mantle into some sort of holy relic. But to be honest with you, it's more simple. It was just a cloak. It's his cloak. And he just goes, and he's just walking by, and all of a sudden he just throws his cloak, and then he just keeps walking. It wouldn't have been the most appealing call. You know, I just had my cloak dry cleaned. (laughs) Those were less sanitary conditions in those days. We're talking about a cloak that would have been soaked in his sweat and probably his tears and lots of dirt, and now he's throwing it on Elisha, who has no idea what is happening. He's just minding his own business, plowing a field. (laughs) Did it land on his head? (laughs) And he's blind. You know, what is going on? He had no idea what's happening. Could seem rather odd to Elisha. Rather casual, kind of abrupt, seemingly out of nowhere. And if I'm honest with you this evening, this is all rather ordinary and boring. I mean, let's be honest. I would imagine that something so important as the call of Elijah's replacement, the great prophet of Israel, it might require a little more ceremony in my mind. I mean, seriously? This guy's going to replace you and you're just throwing your dirty, nasty cloak on him and walking by? Elijah didn't go up to uh, Elisha, put his hand on his head, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. He just threw his mantle, kept on walking. The call of God is rarely an exciting experience. It's really never that glorious. And how many people miss out on the God opportunities of life because they're waiting for something big and grand to happen to them? They're waiting for the ceremony. They're waiting for the pastor. They're waiting for the evangelist to call them out in a service to single them, na- to single them out. And meanwhile, God opportunities are happening all around them. Cloaks are being thrown on them and they're just casting them off. What's this nasty stuff? Who do you think I am? See, Elisha didn't know the full extent of what's happening. He simply sees it as a call to serve. And the revelation we get here is that even the greatest levels of calling are presented with such simplicity in the kingdom of God. Because leadership and ministry is not lording over people, but rather serving other people. The calling of the disciples of Jesus followed the same pattern as Elisha and Elijah. They were working when he called them, whether it's fishermen, that he walked by and throws a mantle and says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Or it's Matthew, the tax collector, sitting at his booth, a man that we would all try to avoid, sitting at his tax booth, collecting taxes, and Jesus walks by him and throws a mantle of opportunity on him. And he gets up and he just begins to follow Jesus. See, the mantle represents ministry and ministry is the calling of every follower of Christ. The Lord causes someone to walk by us and casts an opportunity our way. And ministry opportunities, just like this mantle, are many times just thrown on you. I want you to think about the ministry of Jesus Christ himself. Where did it all begin? It began at a wedding where Jesus was minding his own business. And his mom comes by and casts a need on him. Jesus, they're out of wine. And Jesus is like, what's that got to do with me, woman? Like, you know, it's like, what are you talking about? It's not even my time yet. 
but a mantle of ministry, a need was cast upon him. And that very act is what brought him into the ministry. It seemed insignificant, but he simply responded to the need that was cast upon him. Matthew chapter 8 tells us the whole essence of his ministry was just needs being cast upon him. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. His entire ministry was just mantle of ministry, mantle of ministry, mantle of ministry being cast upon him and him simply responding to it. The word of God shows us many opportunities that people had to minister to Jesus. They're actually very simple. Luke chapter 19, Jesus needed a colt to ride into Jerusalem. You know, somebody had to release that colt. Somebody had a colt. It was their resource. It was their property. Jesus tells his disciples, go on inside. You're going to find a colt uh, colt tied up uh, and uh, bring it here. And if somebody asks you, you know, just tell them the Lord has need of it. Can you imagine you're the owner of the colt and you're just sitting there, standing there and two guys walk up and they just start untying your colt. They just grab the keys of your car and just step inside. You're like, what are you doing, bro? It's my car, man. The Lord has need of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Evidently, that phrase was enough for this man. The mantle, the Lord has need of it. Well, then what am, who am I to hold it back? You know, they needed a place to have the Last Supper. That was somebody's house. Jesus tells them, go follow a guy. He's going to be carrying a water pitcher. And then he'll go into a house, and that's the house. And he asks the master and tell him the Lord needs a room. And the guy's like, okay. <laughs> a need is presented to him. A mantle is cast upon him. And he simply says, you can have my home. All that I have belongs to you. There's no pomp and circumstance with that. There's no grand ceremony. There's no bless you, my child. Thank you for letting me into your home. I mean, there's nothing. We don't even see or know who the guy is. How about when Jesus was carrying his cross towards Calvary and it became too much to bear. And as they lead him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. This guy's minding his own business. He's not looking for ministry. He's not looking to help Jesus. He's just minding his own business, and all of a sudden a cross is cast upon him, and he ministers to Jesus by carrying it all the way to Calvary for him. See, the text reveals a number of important truths about the mantle of ministry. The mantle of ministry is a mantle of sacrifice. It will always require that you lay something down. Elisha is plowing in the field. This is likely his family business. He's plowing with the 12th yoke of oxen. They would plow in a line. The man with the 12th yoke would be the leader. He'd be the director. Number one would be down there. Two, three, four, five, six, all the way to 12. And 12 would keep the line straight. He would direct from that place. He had a good career. He had a good position in his career. The mantle is thrown. He exchanges some words with Elijah. We're going to look at it in a minute. And then he does this. He turns back from him, takes a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. What is Elisha doing here? Elisha was plowing with the oxen when he was called and now he is burning the oxen. He used the equipment of his career to burn it behind him. He is making a sacrifice. See, what he's doing and the things he is burning represented his purpose and his meaning and his identity and his resources up to this point in his life. This is what he knew. This is all he knew. From the time he was a young boy, you're going to be a plowman. That's what we do. You're going to plow with the oxen. And he's raised from a young child. And all of the sudden, the mantle is cast upon him. And he realizes, I'm going to have to lay something down if I'm going to pick this thing up. You can't remove the element of sacrifice 
and laying things on the altar from how God works. By burning the oxen, he was going all in on his commitment. God, I'm going to hold nothing back from you. You know, to follow Elijah, Elisha left a good job, a good career. He left his family. He left his land. He left his money. He left his inheritance. He gave up a very comfortable, worldly position and broke away from all of his comfortable ties. And he did this to follow a wandering prophet that had very powerful enemies. Sacrifice. You know, not every level of ministry involves this level of sacrifice. The real question for you to answer is if God called you to this level, would you make that sacrifice? But I think an even greater question is, are you making sacrifices to minister at the level you are right now? Are you still making sacrifices in your ministry? Because the mantle of ministry is a mantle of sacrifice. You know what's interesting to me about this is that it was a joy for Elisha to do this. You know what he did is he fed the whole town. He had a festival. He had a feast in his own honor. This was not a woe is me pity party. Oh man, look at all that I'm giving up to follow God. I know, I know, I can't believe I'm doing it either. I'm such a noble man. No, no, no. This was a farewell feast. It was a token of joy at his new calling. Come and celebrate with me. And when you come, I'm going to bless you by filling your bellies with food. We're going to have a great time. The second truth we discover is that the mantle of ministry is a mantle of service. Elisha was selected by God to succeed Elijah, but he actually just served Elijah. He was selected to succeed Elijah, but he actually just served Elijah. He left the oxen, ran after Elijah, and became his servant. Elisha felt the weight of the mantle. He felt the weight of responsibility that was on Elijah. And he responded by coming alongside to help Elijah carry that weight. This is where the ministry of Elisha began. Not by dividing the waters of the Jordan. Not by healing the waters of Jericho. It didn't start by healing Naaman's leprosy. It didn't start by building his own name and building his own ministry. It began by serving. And it was always a test. Was he prepared to take a lowly subordinate place? That's what a servant is one who places himself at the disposal of another, one who is ready to take orders from him, who promotes the other's interest. As soon as he followed Elijah, he came under his authority. Watch what he does. Elisha said, please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Please let me. He didn't even know this man, but yet his heart was immediately submitted to him. He wasn't even going to do the next thing until he got permission from this man. We are called to follow God, but God leads us through men. And I will tell you, imperfect men. The nature of his request reveals that he was not a man devoid of natural feelings. He was not a robot. This was not something robotic. He's like, okay, I'll follow whatever you say. I have no feelings. I don't care about anything else in life. He's saying, please let me kiss my father and mother. He, what he's saying, this is an affectionate son who is obviously attached to his parents. He doesn't just want to get up and go. He has feelings about this. He's connected with his family. This is going to cost him something. It's going to cost him in the realm of relationships. But it also speaks to an act of accountability, both to his family and to Elijah. I am reorganizing and directing my priorities now to serve the purposes of God, and I'm doing this on record with all of you. It's critical because when ministry gets hard, there's a real temptation to turn back. And it's much easier to do if you've never told anyone or been accountable about it. Elijah's saying, I'm going to be accountable. 
I'm going on record. If I ever show back up to this house, you're going to know I did something wrong because I belong out there with that man. We see why humility is so critical in the call of God in our discipleship and development. You know, there's a difference between receiving the mantle to serve versus give me the mantle because I have skills. I got gifts, Pastor. You have no idea. If you'd spend a little time with me, you'd know. I got skills you know not of, Pastor. <laughs> if you knew about my skills, <laughs> you would have cast that mantle years ago. You wouldn't even waste the time with the mantle. You would have had a ceremony for me. A disciple must have a posture of a servant because it's through this role that we're discipled. It's not a glamorous beginning. It's a very humble beginning. But this is where we all must start. Surrendered to serve under the mantle of ministry. Many times we see a need thrown at our attention and we just think it's someone else's job. You know, you're walking through the parking lot and you notice there's some trash in there. And your first thought is not, man, I need to go get a trash can. Your first thought is, what's up with our groundskeeper? <laughs> Doesn't somebody get paid to do this? Like, there's a need. It's like cast right in front of you in the form of a thirst buster cup. <laughs> and your first thought is not, how can I respond to this need? How can I help? <laughs> the first thought is, where's, where, where's our custodial crew? Don't we have cleaning ladies for stuff like this? Many times it's easy to pass it off to others and think it's their responsibility. My father told me, when he was uh, very newly saved, that he uh, was worshiping God in an altar call and he saw this little boy, probably five years old, come to the altar. This is probably 46, 47 years ago now. And uh, he comes, Veterans Boulevard, our very first building, this little five-year-old boy comes to the altar. And my, my dad just happens to open his eyes and see this little boy and he's just thinking to himself, somebody needs to go pray for that boy, you know, <laughs> like... I mean, and then he's like, nobody's praying for him. So he goes down and he prays for the boy. And as he's praying for this boy, this young five-year-old kid, this young, young boy starts like telling him things and like pouring his heart out to him. And he's like, whoa, this kid actually needs ministry. And, uh, and so he doesn't think much of it. And, and he, he, he uh, goes back in another service. He sees another kid uh, around the same age go down to the altar. And he's, well, nobody else is praying for him. Let me go pray for him. And so he goes to pray for this boy. And again, the same thing happens. This boy opens up to him. And so my father goes to Pastor Warner and he says, you know, Pastor Warner, we really need some sort of ministry for the children in our church. And Pastor Warner said, ah. Yep, that's right, Frank. And he rolls off. My dad was furious. Like what? He doesn't take me seriously? Like, come on, man. And so uh, <laughs> Pastor Mitchell was coming to town. You know how you get your pastor? You tell on him to his pastor. <laughs> ah, that's what my dad's going to do. So he sees Pastor Mitchell in town and he goes up to Pastor Mitchell after service and he's just like, you know, Pastor Mitchell, I've been trying to tell Pastor Warner that we need somebody to minister to our children. And Pastor Mitchell just, <laughs> he won't do anything about it, Pastor. <laughs> Maybe that's because God's calling you to do it, Frank. And he walks off. And 47 years ago, our children's ministry was birthed in the Tucson church because a need was thrown on somebody. And though he tried to cast it off at first, he realized ministry is simply trying to meet a need. Amen. The truth is, if you can't serve in the small areas, God will not promote you to larger areas. Those who would be given important commissions must prove themselves. Elisha became the servant of God's servant. Elisha became the servant of God's servant. 
In fact, this was so prevalent that it became ingrained in his identity. That Elisha became known for his service to Elijah. Even after Elijah is gone and Elisha has already performed some miracles, Jehoshaphat is looking for a prophet. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. In other words, in their mind, I'm not sure, but I know he did serve Elijah. He served him. That was his identity. Who is this man, Elisha? Well, I, he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Well, bring him here, because he must have something we don't have. He spent that much time with him. He served him. But that became his identity. And the final truth we learn about the mantle of ministry is that it is a mantle of the supernatural. Elisha was afforded many privileges over his time under the mantle of Elijah's ministry. He watched Elijah calling fire down from heaven multiple times. And when the cloak reappears in scripture, he watched his pastor strike the waters with that same cloak that had been thrown on him years earlier. He watched the waters of the Jordan divide, and this is what inspired him later to contend for the supernatural in his own ministry. The Bible says he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over because the mantle of ministry is a supernatural mantle. Watching Elijah up close and personal gave him a revelation that this is just a normal man operating under the direction and the anointing of his God. And if I'm going to be able to accomplish anything for him, it will only be by his power. Amen. Where is the God of Elijah? I want to close and talk about picking up the mantle. Because Elijah did something very important for Elisha's future, and I think you'll miss it if you're not paying attention. But as Elijah throws his mantle on Elisha, he walks away. Elisha then comes to him, and he says, I want to kiss everyone goodbye. I want to say my goodbyes. And Elijah says to him something very important. He says, go back again for what have I done to you. This is some incredible insight to the call of God. And it is very important, and it is a critical mindset for long-term faithfulness. Because even though the mantle is passed from one person to the next, the mantle belongs to God. It doesn't belong to man. We hold it for a moment, and then we cast it to the next person. But it does not belong to us. The mantle belongs to God. And Elijah is making sure that Elisha knows that this calling came from God. It did not come from me. It came from God. It didn't originate with me, Elisha. It goes much deeper than what you're seeing on the surface. Uh, all of this originated back in the cave uh, when I heard a still small voice tell me to anoint you. This is a God thing. What have I done to you, Elisha? This is something that is between you and God. You're going to have to work this out, Elisha. Paul says, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's necessary understanding because when the luster of ministry is gone and the excitement is gone and the problems arise, you will need to know that this is something God has called you to. It's happened to some of the followers of Jesus as they face the realities of ministry. Once it didn't work out according to their imagination and their plans and desires. John 6, 6, 6, uh, John 6, verse 66. John 6, verse 66. Coincidence? As a result of this, many of his disciples abandoned him and no longer walked with him. They felt the weight of ministry. It wasn't what they expected. They thought this was a man thing. 
And then Jesus is saying things that make them realize this is a God thing. I wasn't ready for that. I didn't, I'm not sure about this. And they walk away and follow him no longer. You fast forward to 2 Kings. And Elisha has now been following Elijah for some time. He's believed to be about 10 years at this point. Pouring water in the hands of the prophet. And God is going to take Elijah up into heaven. And Elisha is aware of it. He knows what's happening. He has a sense of what's happening. And Elijah tries to get Elisha to stay behind three different times. Just stay here while I go over there. And Elisha says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going anywhere. He refuses to leave him. And so finally, Elijah turns to Elisha and he says, what can I do for you before I'm taken away? It seems like Elijah wanted to return the favor of the last 10 years of Elisha's service. And Elisha makes a profound request. He says, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Why did Elisha request a double portion of his spirit? I would guess it is because by this time he had seen past the glamour of ministry. Past the, he had seen the obstacles. He had felt the weight of the ministry on his pastor. He had seen the betrayals. He had seen the dangers of ministry. He had seen the loneliness involved in all of it. And he is saying to himself and thinking to himself, uh, I don't know what lies ahead for me. I don't know what I'm going to face. But if I'm going to face it, I'm going to need a little bit of your spirit to face it. In fact, I'm going to need twice the amount of spirit that you have because I'm half the man you are. He didn't ask for a double portion of Elijah's ministry. He didn't ask for a double portion of Elijah's influence. He didn't ask for a double portion of Elijah's, uh, of Elijah's miracles. He asked for a double portion of his spirit. Uh, I need to catch the spirit behind uh, what you do. Uh, I need to catch the spirit that drives you. I need to catch this thing because I will not make it long term uh, unless I have your spirit. Watch what happens next as the Lord takes up Elijah into the heaven, 2 Kings 2. Verse 11, then it happened as they continued on and talked. It suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. And so he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into pieces. Elisha's left alone. He's in real pain because of the severing of their close relationship. My father, my father. He tears his clothes, which is a token of his deep grief. Elisha is left all alone with the mantle which has fallen from Elijah onto the ground. Now he knows fully what this mantle represents. He knows the cost involved. You know, the first time the mantle was just thrown on him. But this time it has fallen at his feet. The first time it was an exciting adventure. There was the unknown before him. But this time it involves a sober reflection. He has to make a decision. Am I going to pick up this mantle? I know what this costs. I've watched the price paid to carry this mantle. I'm not young anymore. I've seen some things. I know what this represents. This is what makes it so hard for veterans of the ministry. You know, when we're young, you know, we have no idea what the cost is involved. Send me anywhere, Pastor. Send me to Timbuktu. I'll go. You spend some years in Timbuktu and you're wondering, what in the world am I doing here? You pay the price. You see the cost. And then one day a mantle falls on the ground before you. 
And you're looking at it and you're thinking to yourself, do I really want to pick that up? Church kids and pastor's kids struggle with this. They watch their parents pay the price for ministry. They watch betrayals. They've watched the cost of relationships involved. They've watched pain and suffering. They've watched sickness. They've watched their parents go through hell and back. They have to ask themselves the question. This generation, you have to ask yourself the question. Am I going to pick up this mantle? I know what this costs now. Is the next generation going to pick up the mantle? Ministry can be so messy sometimes. The Bible says he took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And he went back and he stood by the bank of the Jordan. I'm here to say tonight, somebody has to pick up the mantle. Are you willing to pick up the mantle? Are you prepared to pick up the mantle? Are you positioning yourself with sacrifice and service in the smallest areas of life to pick up the mantle. Because the final lesson we learn here is that God's work goes on even after his servant is gone. Charles Wesley said God buries his workmen, but he carries on his work. You know, this is God's story. It's not our story. It's not my story or your story. We're just playing a small little part in this magnificent story that God is writing. Listen to God's commentary after Moses died to Joshua. He says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I'm giving them, the children of Israel. In other words, okay, one servant is gone. Next servant up, pick up the mantle, let's go. Let's go. We're moving on. My work continues. Just because Elijah is gone, you can't stand around just staring at the mantle all day. Somebody's got to pick up the mantle. And that also tells us that we're all responsible to throw the mantle to the next generation. There's people here tonight, God's been challenging you to throw the mantle. And you're like, no, 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 it's my mantle. This is my ministry. I've been doing this for 35 years. You can't take, I'm not, I'm not giving this thing up. I'm going to die with this mantle. <laughs> and God's like, your ministry is dying, son. Just cast it on somebody. Like, please. <laughs> we have this incredible sound man in Tucson, Paul Arbo. He's been our sound man for 40-something years. And, and about seven or eight years ago, he got this revelation like, man, I'm getting old, man. This is really hard to keep up with the schedule of this church. And he started, like, investing in these young guys, man. These young guys started showing interest. He started taking them, started showing them sound. He started giving them all the information they needed. He trained them. I mean, he did everything. And now we have a team of, like, eight sound men who can do any board at any time, in any place, anywhere. And... Paul Arbo is loving life. Like he thought it was going to deflate his purpose in the kingdom. Instead, it's increased it. He's now working in children's ministry. He doesn't have to sit there behind the board every service. He's got, he just schedules people and they're doing it. And if something's wrong, he just lets them know, hey man, fix that. He casts a mantle on the next generation and somebody picked it up. Too many people are worried about the will of God for their lives. What is the will of God for my life? I'll tell you that is a me-centered search. The greater question is what is the will of God? And then how do I serve his will? Not what's the will of God for my life. What is his will? And then what's my part to serve inside of that will? Because not everybody is called to preach but we are all called to minister. I want to ask you to bow your heads this evening. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a couple of minutes. Nobody looking around. If you're here this evening and you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I have the best news of all, and that is that God loves you. He loves you so much, he demonstrated his love for you. At the worst place and the worst time of your life, 
He sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on a cross for your sins. He took your place. He took the judgment that you deserve for your sin and he took it upon himself 2,000 years ago. He was judged for your sins, for my sins. And the Bible says if we will receive that sacrificial, that substitutionary sacrifice in our place, if we'll say, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I know that I'm a sinner. And I want to put my faith in your sacrifice for my life. The Bible says you can be saved tonight. Your relationship with God that you were created to have can be restored. And while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, you say, Pastor, I'm not right with God, but I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ for my salvation. Would you lift up your hand where I could see it all across this place as God's dealing with your heart. Just lift it up quickly and say, Pastor, that's me. I need your prayer. I want to give my life to Jesus tonight. Every head bowed, every eye closed. A moment between you and God. Just lift it up quickly and say, Pastor, I need your prayer. Before you change the order of the service and move on to something else, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Just lift up your hand. Maybe you're backslidden. At one time you were serving God, and now you're far from God. And you say, Pastor, I need to come back to Jesus. Lift up your hand where I can see it all across this place. We're going to take some time to pray in a minute, but we're waiting for you. Just lift it up and say, Pastor, I need your prayer tonight. Hallelujah. Church, I want to challenge you this evening. Maybe you're tired in the ministry and you need to be refreshed for a new season of ministry. Maybe you're burnt out like Elijah. You've been caring so much. God wants to bring a season of refreshing to your life. It's so bad you've been running. You've been hiding in caves. You've been avoiding the mantle altogether. Or maybe you're here tonight and you think, well, you know what? I'm better than that. I have special gifts and I've been waiting for somebody to reach out to me instead of rather serving in every need that's presented to me. I'll, I'll ask you a question. Are you better than Elisha? Are you better than the disciples of Christ that you don't need to serve? There's others here tonight. The mantle has fallen to your feet. You've been contemplating it. There's a number of young people and pastor's kids tonight. You're staring at that mantle. You've been staring at it for a long time. And you're thinking, let me get my career first. Let me get my, my house. I'm going to buy a house first. I watch my parents suffer. I'm not going to suffer like that. The mantle's fallen to your feet and it's been sitting there. It's growing stale and old. Somebody's got to pick it up. Maybe you're counting the cost. Maybe you've been a veteran in ministry. You know what that mantle will cost you. And man, you're just sitting there going, I'm not sure I want to pick this up again. Somebody's got to pick up the mantle. Maybe God's calling you tonight to cast the mantle. That it's time for you to start working with the next generation. And you've been afraid, well, if I do that, I'm going to become irrelevant. The reality is that God wants to expand you. He wants to expand his work in the earth. This is how he scales his kingdom. This is how he moves his kingdom forward. He does it by more people, more ministers doing ministry. He expands it. He wants us to, he wants to send people alongside of you to serve you, to help relieve the burden of ministry. We should all be looking to replace ourselves so that his kingdom can expand and grow. Tonight, the mantle of ministry is being cast. Are you going to pick it up? Are you going to take it? Maybe it's the mantle of missions. God's calling you. Are you going to pick it up and pay the price? These altars are open tonight. I want you to come and find a place to pray. We're going to sing a song and worship God. You come, find a place to pray this evening. Bring your heart before God. Say, God, I'm not going to stare at this thing any longer. I'm going to pick it up, whatever it costs me. And I'm going to serve your purposes, God. This is my desire to honor you. You know, um, I was thinking about this today. I'm, um, I was... Uh, for, I was 15. I just turned 15 years old. I was at an altar call similar to this one. At just It was a normal service. And God spoke to my heart and said, you're going to be a missionary in Africa. 15 years old. 
It's like a, a, a mantle was thrown on me. It was, it was weird. 15 years old. You're not going to be a missionary at 15 years old. But what that did was that caused me to start taking life a little more seriously. I didn't know if I'd ever make it to be a missionary, but I did know I had to position myself. I figured, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty simple guy. I think of things very simple. If I'm going to be a missionary, it means I should be a pastor first. If I'm going to be a pastor, that means I should probably be married. If I'm going to get married, I should probably get a job. So I got a job. I got a job. <laughs> Started working. I started getting involved at the church. I started following the door director around. I started cleaning bathrooms and toilets and picking up trash in the parking lot. I am a missionary in Africa. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I could barely point to it on a map. But I did know I have to position myself under the mantle of ministry. I began serving in the church and God blessed me with a wonderful wife. And you know, I, it, it was it was. 14 years later before I ever became a missionary in Africa. God had a lot to do in me first. And it all had to do with me learning how to serve people, learning how to serve God and serve people. And as I look back on 30 years of salvation and you realize it doesn't matter where you go or what you do, it's always serving. It is all, you, we never stop serving. He who desires to be the greatest among you must be a slave to all. <laughs> like it doesn't, it never changes. You never reach a position where you're not a servant in the kingdom of God. The Gentiles don't do it that way. The world doesn't do it that way. But in the kingdom of God, it starts with service and sacrifice. And I want to encourage you, you, you a mantle can be cast your way. It could be as simple as picking up trash or it could be as complicated as you might do this someday. If, if you just aim at ministry and you aim your life at ministry, then whatever that calling, wherever it takes you, I didn't know what city, I didn't know what nation. I didn't need all those answers. All I knew was I got to start ministering. I got to learn how to minister. I need to learn the word of God. I need to learn how to pray. I need to learn how to, I need to start positioning myself under the mantle of ministry so that wherever God wants to unplug me and plug me back in, I just keep ministering. That's what I am. I serve here. I can serve here. You know, it doesn't matter where you put me. I can minister here. I can minister here. You I'll put me in another nation, I'll just keep ministering because that's what I am. I'm under the mantle of ministry and all the kingdom of God is ministry. So aim for ministry. And you don't have to play the stupid game, am I called to preach? Am I not called to preach? You can settle in your heart, I'm called to minister and I'm going to minister. And wherever that takes me, God, I'm fully surrendered to your will. I'll make sacrifices and I'll serve. Amen. The Lord bless you. That's all I have this evening. Praise the Lord. A wonderful, wonderful message, revelation this evening. Uh, thank God for it. Uh,